Well, hello and thank you for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And today our guest is Dr. Christina Greer, Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University, a frequent analyst, explainer of all things political, the author of Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, a topic very much in the news today. Christina, thank you so much for being Thank you for having for me. For being here with us. Yes, I must say that you really are perhaps one of our very best explainers. <laughs> the question is, what is going on? Oh, I wish I knew. It's a great moment to be an educator right now because I've had to rethink how I teach a lot of things. Intro to politics, race and ethnic politics, um, urban politics even. Uh, we're, we're in uncharted waters, right? And right. We, Everything has changed. Everything, and we've right. had these very long-standing institutions that have worked relatively well, um, and we now have a, a president who wants to sort of upend many of these long-standing institutions. Um, so we have to, in some ways, wait and see. I know, and so far it seems to be succeeding in that. I, I think that, that the kernel of it is that so far he's at least tr attempting to deliver exactly what he promised to deliver. Yes and no. Yes. I mean, some of these, some might call them egregious executive orders, are, are just that. But an executive order only has the, the legs that, you know, sort of that last through a president. But keep in mind, Congress controls the power of the purse, and an executive order is not a law. So when you sort of sift right. through some of these executive orders, they have potential to be incredibly harmful to millions of Americans. But if Congress refuses to fund them, which we will see, you know, he, we have unified government right now, which means the Republicans control the House and the Senate and the presidency. Um, but if they stand up to this particular president or feel like he's overreaching, they may not finance some of these initiatives in the, in the way that he wants them to. So we'll, I think yes. right now there's a lot of hysteria and distraction, which is working very well, especially against the Democrats. But when we sort of pull the thread just a little bit, I'm not sure if uh, Donald Trump is going to get everything that he, he's presenting to his supporters. So now I want to find out, I always ask a guest to place him or herself in black America because I want to find out where this all started, your thinking about blackness and thinking about politics. And, and when we were talking earlier, it happened very young for you, mm -hmm. five years old. Right. So I was born in New York, in Queens specifically. Yeah, yeah Queens girl. Go Mets. <laughs> um, and then we moved to Philadelphia when I was five. So that was the transition between right. Frank Rizzo, the mayor, who... I don't know people who know Frank Rizzo, but I, as a young child, saw him as a very you, brash, some might argue so racist. So he had an effect on you at five yeah, he years did. old. So that, he you, did. that still is in play to this day. Mm -hmm. And, so. you know, sort of that, and Reagan was president sort of mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was five, um, and I found him to be very frightening. I didn't like the way he spoke. And, you know, I always heard my parents talking about him in not a positive way. Um, and then I pulled the lever for Jesse Jackson in 84 because my, my school was a polling station. And so I'm not from, you know, an incredibly political family. I mean, we did go to a few marches here and there. And so I guess that would, you know, sort of be more political than most. My parents are definitely um, avid voters. Um, and now that I'm older, I realize we actually did talk about politics a lot more in the household than... I possibly thought maybe right. not in the in the way where it's like we're sitting down and going to talk about <laughs> politics right now. But you know, I talk time, family yeah, time. But I remember, right. you know, when uh, the when Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas hearings were on television. I remember that was on constantly. Right. Um, you know, and sort of asking questions about gender and and race. You know, in in sort of a young person's mind, why is this happening? And having my parents sit down and really explain. You know who Clarence Thomas is. And right, right. And they also the, they also at an early age had to explain then why you were a black family living in a white neighborhood or a white right town. And you know, in Mount Airy was a very diverse neighborhood, but you know, sort of very. My school was very white. Mm -hmm. um, our neighborhood, you know, was not. It was diverse, but you know, not that diverse. Uh, but we also had sort of this long, you know, tradition from my father's fraternity and my mother's sorority, both black fraternities right. and sororities. Um, so a very close-knit black upbringing mm -hmm. with um, my parents' friends and their children who were basically like extended cousins from across the country. Right, so this is a professional family. Your dad was? Mm -hmm. uh, engineer slash marketing and right. my mother sort of similar. She 
started off as a flight attendant and then worked her way up through the airline industry in sales and marketing. Right, and well. you were saying she was one of the first black guy uh, flight attendants, flight attendants, from attendants Eastern, right? Eastern, Eastern Airlines. <laughs> I think I may still have my the wings. My wings. <laughs> the right? wings. Um, so then you go off to college, mm -hmm. Tufts, right? Went to Tufts. And now the book, as I'm reading, your your book apparently started from the first day you set foot on campus because right. you understood that there were black people and black people. Right. And so, you know, growing up, I'm surrounded by black people, you know, sort of in our, our family and, and friend circle, but I never really teased out sort of ethnicity. Um, Caribbean and African identity, sort of, you know, and Africa is a continent of 54 countries, you know, and so uh, when I got to Tufts and you have the option of going to the Cape, and so that already sets up an interesting dynamic, students who choose to go and those who choose not to go. And some choose not to go because they have other commitments, some choose not to go because they don't want to go. And so unfortunately that, that all sets up a dynamic of why were you, why didn't you attend? And so that's being addressed sort of in years oh, to this, come. Oh, this was the gathering that they offered yes, for black students. Exactly. The first, Three what, days, 60, yeah. 60 students? 60 largest black class at the time ever, ever. in the history of the university. Um, and so the, the facilitator asked a question the first day, you know, right there, um, close your eyes and raise your hands. And, you know, if your parents told you when you get to Tufts, don't get wrapped up with the black kids. It's like, this is an odd question. <laughs> We're all no, black we on are, the trip. We are like, the black kids. Right, right, we are the black kids. <laughs> and I opened up my eyes and realized that everyone's hands were raised except for the six black Americans that happened to be in the room. Right. Um, right. And so we had to, to really dissect that because that's not something that my parents told me. I mean, my sister was down the road in Cambridge and she was a senior and I was a freshman and I'd been going to visit her almost on a monthly basis for three years. Um, but I, I did not expect that the first day of school. Yeah. You say in the book that uh, the, uh, the blacks who were not born in this country were perceived to be higher on the ladder. Right. And so setting up this dynamic, you know, and, and even from, you know, freshman advising, right, these assumptions that if your parents were Caribbean or African, that you were harder working, um, that you weren't on financial aid, that, you know, you came from a successful family and sort of some stereotypes and assumptions of blacks is essentially last place, right, in, in the United States where in many ways it is still a dichotomous relationship of black versus white and sort of we have lots of diversity in between, but the history of this country is anti-black racism, white supremacy and patriarchy, like those are facts, right? So when you have black immigrants coming in and they're well aware of the history of the United States, Many of them argue, why would I want to be with the group that's perceived as last place? Mm -hmm. So with black immigrants, I found in the interviews and the surveys that I did, this is, these are some of the first immigrant groups who are actually choosing to remain immigrant in a certain capacity, mm -hmm. where everyone else wants to assimilate really assimilate. quickly. Sure. Um, this is, you know, I want something that actually keeps me apart from the other, which is the black American group. Right. So now let's uh, go to some current events now. Mm -hmm. um, I've, uh, I was looking at your Twitter account. You have a big following too, you know, <laughs> this is, uh, and I think what you said today, I think it's time to start thinking of who can primary these Democrats. Let's see how they vote for SCOTUS non nominee. Mm -hmm. So this is um, President Trump's first uh, nominee for the Supreme Court, uh, Neil uh, Gorsuch. Uh, what, what do you think? Well, I think after sort of the, the past 11 days that have been yes. so tumultuous and <laughs> yes. chaotic, um, and we've seen some Democrats stand up and others really think that they can rationalize not just with the president but with the party, and what they're not re remembering is these last eight years, Republicans have not been willing to work with Democrats right. in any capacity, especially not Barack Obama. These are people who skipped the inauguration so that they could plan on how to make Barack Obama a one-term president. So they've blocked the president and also the Democratic right. Party at every turn. So now that the tables are turned, there's so many Democrats who think that they can sit down and be rational. But this is a president that is wholly irrational. Um, and so he's been so chaotic. I think some Democrats are saying we have to stand up, and many of them may be from states where there's, you know, people are watching, um, and those states may be a little more blue. Um, and there are lots of Democrats who are from states where they're looking at the numbers where they saw that, you know, their state went for Trump. And they're up Claire in McCaskill. Claire McCaskill. And, you know, in 2018, she'll sure. be, she knows that she'll be challenged on some of these things. So she's voting, I think, 
strategically so that she can go back to her state and say, well, you know, I did work with the Republicans on these issues. Mm -hmm. And then there are other Democrats who I think are sort of voting sincerely on particular individuals and they're saving some of their obstinate behavior for something like a SCOTUS pick, right? They don't want to just be seen as no, 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 the party of no, and then not giving anyone a chance. And then the attorney general pick as well. So and, that's... I mean, the difference is, you know, and I understand strategic voting, you know, and you don't want to just sort of say no to everyone because then it sort of dilutes the power of your no. The difference is, though, so many of these cabinet choices are so unqualified or unfit mm -hmm. or un-American, quite honestly, and should not be there. So to vote no is not just a partisan no. It's really like you need to think about not just the country, but the future of the country. You know, with, with an energy secretary in Rick Perry who doesn't know that he'd be in charge of the nuclear codes. Or Betsy DeVos who's never stepped foot in a public school and is very clear that she wants to dismantle all public schools. You know, yeah, that's the foundation it, of yeah. our democracy. It seemed like a lot of the nominees were there to destroy the agencies that, right. they, that they would be Specifically. running. So Betsy DeVos, let's talk about her a bit. Uh, big charter school choice. Mm -hmm in education advocate, billionaires, mm -hmm. you know, who did not perform very well in uh, the hearings. No. And yet. And has a history of sort of even failure on the, the local level in Michigan mm -hmm. when she's tried to implement things. So these are also people who aren't really great administrators and leaders. Um, I really worry, you know, the charter school issues is fascinating because it doesn't actually just break down on partisan lines. So there is a lot of diversity mm -hmm. in thought amongst Republicans and Democrats, among black people and white people, cities and suburbs. So, I mean, this isn't a, a clear cut issue. The, the issue with DeVos, though, is because she believes in vouchers and vouchers have a, a very specific racialized history. We know that the people who will probably almost definitely not benefit from whatever system she puts in place are going to be poor children and also children of color. Right. And so if we already know, if we look at her brief history of education, we can, and we already know that the system's inequitable, it's more segregated than say when you were growing up or when you know, our, our grandparents were growing up. So someone like that who's wholly just, just inept, you know, and, and the measure of a real democracy is how we educate our young. Mm -hmm. If we're putting someone like that right. at the helm, you know, and, and a president who, you know, has no respect for the English language, he's never been to a public school, um, and how they view public schools already as mm -hmm. these sort of, you know, places where only the, the worst people go, and so we'll figure it right. out. But right. we know, I mean, a man who lives in a tower filled with gold for 70 years is probably not the person who cares about your child's education. Right, right. Well, it's this whole privatization, not yeah. only of schools, but of prisons of, you know. Of sort of, of our country. You right. know? And, and I think, though, the prisons piece is really important because as we've seen, and, you know, I've got a colleague, Carla Shedd, who's written a great book on the school to prison pipeline. If we see schools, especially for poor children and children of color, as essentially the breeding ground for prisons, Mm -hmm. and you want to privatize these schools so that we know certain people will make money and others will make nothing off of the bodies of sort of our most vulnerable populations. We'll see this link between schools and prisons that's strengthened even more mm -hmm. under this particular administration in a really particular short period of time. Yeah, I remember recently sitting uh, in a booth in a restaurant behind a group of men who were apparently in the private school business, you know, the mm -hmm. charter school business. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that they were talking about was bottom lines and profit mm -hmm. and... Well, know, I think it's so interesting to see how many hedge fund managers, especially in New York, are behind the charter school movement. Exactly. You know? So it's like, that's it's interesting. <laughs> Your kids don't go to the charter schools. You've never For been sure. to a charter school, but like you're really, really invested in this in, a, in right. a host of ways. And I mean, I think it's something to be said about, you know, inauguration evening when the stocks for private prisons go through the roof Precisely. with the, the nomination of Donald Trump. You Precisely. know, and I mean, I think, you know, Angela Davis has written extensively about this, but, you know, we have a surplus of capital in this country. Mm -hmm. And so we need to warehouse particular bodies so that they are removed from the economic sphere. Um, and I think that Donald Trump, if he can't deport millions, he will imprison millions. And that will at least help make his friends lots of money. And, you know, he'll find a way to make money himself off of this particular enterprise. And so, I don't think that that's being histrionic or conspiracy theorist. I think we can look at the history of how he believes in privatization and sort of see how he will use those bodies. Exactly. So we talked about this uh, introduction of the Supreme Court nominee being sort of normalized or looking like 
he was behaving like a president. It looked presidential. Mm -hmm preceded by all of these days of total chaos, mm -hmm. the immigration, quote, ban, that mm -hmm. they say is not a ban, but a pause. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a clip of him talking about that. Let's listen to that, and then okay. I want your reaction to gotcha. it. It's not a Muslim ban, but we were totally prepared. It's working out very nicely. You see it at the airports. You see it all over. It's working out very nicely, and we're going to have a very, very strict ban, and we're going to have extreme vetting which we should have had in this country for many years. So not working so nicely after all. People uh, reporting uh, I mean, deaths, uh, tragedy, misery. Uh, wh why do you think he did this? Well, the, the problem is with this particular president is that he doesn't understand the Constitution and he doesn't understand the separation of powers and how the government actually works. So he actually didn't alert any of the agencies mm -hmm. as to what he was doing. So if you don't understand levels of government, and because he's never been elected, he's never served in the military, so these very long-standing institutions of this nation that sort of give you a roadmap and a very clear roadmap as to how you can get things done, he has no idea and he doesn't have people around him that really have a full concrete idea. That's why the chaos ensued. I think, you know, if you if you listen to Rudy Giuliani, who's, you know, quintessential something. Something. <laughs> yes. Um, and he consistently says the, you know, quiet part loud. Right. You know, he's on television the next day saying like, oh no, this is the way that we can sort of ban Muslims, even though it's unconstitutional and like, but we've been working on it. So I think this particular president knows that he has a a certain base that he has to satisfy. These are the people, these are the 33% of the people that always put him over the edge in right. his primaries. Right. These are the people who want blood, right? They're the ones who want to return our nation back to us. What does us mean? Um, we are a nation of immigrants, right? Some voluntary, some involuntary immigrants. That would and be us. That would be us, <laughs> black America. <laughs> but I think this is, what we're seeing is just someone who is so overwhelmed and in uncharted waters that he, he has no idea what's going on. So he's just throwing things out there to see what sticks. But the implementation of it, I mean, if you have unified government, I don't understand why you're not using Congress to try and actually pass laws. Mm -hmm. This is the time to do it. We saw Obama from 2009 to you know, 2010, that two year span where we, we got Obamacare, where, and he also had to save the banks and he had to save the auto industry and deal with you know, some, some uh, environmental crises. Right. But he knew that he had a very small window of time, and Trump probably has a little more time than Obama, but a small window of time to push things through um, as a president. Mm -hmm. uh, his strategy is, is unique, um, largely because he's from a business background, but I think also because he has people around him who don't really know how Washington, D.C. works, but also how federalism works um, mm -hmm. in a nation but also you have 50 states and how you're going to implement them. Right. I, I was interested in your, your comment that you think that Donald Trump is not a businessman, but a salesman. Yeah. And once the deal is done, he has no interest in what? Well, and I think a lot of New Yorkers know that he's a snake oil salesman. You know, I've <laughs> talked to lots of people who have had business sure, dealings with that sure. entire family for generations. Right. And they've said, you know, you'll sign a contract for $5,000. They'll pay you $2,500 after you've done the work. And you say, well, we signed a contract. Mm -hmm. Where's the rest of my money? They say, sue me. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, and so there's a the his... reputation of, of them sure. just constantly shirking people. But, you know, people still work with them. Because if you notice, they usually work with people who are slightly smaller scale than they are. And so now that Trump has the keys to the castle in the American government, it'll be fascinating to see if he uses that same snake oil salesman tactic. Because once people are caught on to, you know, catch on to the right. fact that you're essentially a drifter and a grifter, um, that makes it a little more complicated um, in getting things done. So, so we're looking for signs of courage, you know, these little brilliant streaks of, I think mm -hmm. it was Sally Yates who stood up and mm -hmm. said, uh, I'm not going to do it, right. you know, and she got fired immediately. It right. only took a half an hour, I think, before right. the, the ink And was... the, the reading of how she got fired, I mean, that language is very Trump. The you know? betrayal. Yeah. That she has betrayed uh, the right. presidency, She's actually. Weak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, a lot of his language is also um, sort of latently sexual when it comes to women as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, a, it's always a relationship type language that he uses when he's speaking about powerful women, which I find very disturbing and fascinating all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, any other Democrats, though, that you see who uh, have that, I'm not saying that she's a Democrat, although she worked for uh, President Obama the last uh, right. phase around and was acting attorney general, but who do you see in the Democratic Party 
that can save it because it really needs saving? Well, I mean, luckily, you know, on the Senate side, Kristen Gillibrand has stood up and sort of said no to many nominees. Uh, most um, except for, for um, the Haley. UN, yeah, Nikki Haley. Um, but she's been sort of a leader, you know, and mm -hmm. Chuck Schumer has not. Um, mm -hmm. Chuck Schumer is the leader of the minority party, which is the Democratic Party. Um, I don't put my faith in that basket. Um, Hence where those he, 3,000 people outside his door. Right, <laughs> protesting, <laughs> saying, protesting. You know, if you're going to lead, be a leader, a big right. D Democrat, right? right? These people are not to be rational, you know, uh, rationed with. Um, I, I think Chuck Schumer also thinks that he can make a deal with mm -hmm. Trump. Um, this isn't, you know, the House always wins. There's a reason why Trump ran casinos, right? And so I think Chuck Schumer is leading the Democrats down a, a really dangerous path, thinking that he can sort of uh, work with this particular president. We saw how the Republicans were very successful banning together and saying, no, these are our core values. We are not going to work with this particular president. And they were very successful in that. If the Democrats did the same thing, Let's, let's see what this is. Let's see what the result is. But I think if they continue to sort of say, well, maybe, well, well let's give them a chance. It's like we will take the high road to obscurity. To now, obscurity. on the, the House side, I mean, not surprisingly, we've seen black female leadership. Maxine Waters is just peak right. over this nonsense. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, hopefully she'll be able to corral the CBC to get them to at least be some sort of voting block to ask, mm -hmm. to demand things of their colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, Nancy Pelosi, you know, people always forget, you know, you think that she's from wine country. It's like her father was the mayor of Baltimore. Like, she knows how to fight. And so I, I trust that she'll actually right. stand up more so than I, I trust Chuck Schumer. And then also, it's like, you know, it's not just electoral politics. It's protest politics as well. And I think that we've, we've seen not just the world, but especially this country. You know, there were 10 different protests in Alaska. There were some protests in remote parts of this country where it was yeah. one person. Yeah, I wanted to know what, what you felt about that. I mean, there were a lot of people who were conflicted about the march. Oh, yeah. Well, and there have been several marches. So the Women's March. I mean, right. I, I do think, you know, it was very clear. It's like, I did my job. I went to the polls. I took people to the polls. And as a black woman, 94% of us showed up and did what we were supposed to do. Historically, white women are not mm -hmm. Democratic voters. They historically are Republican voters. Jane Jun, who's a political scientist at USC, is has doc well documented this data. Um, so and 53%, of course, of them who voted for Donald voted Trump for, this last time right. around. But and other people who didn't get their family members, you know, and sort of right, you know, proselytized, right. get right. them to change their so, lives. So you're saying that since you voted, you didn't feel the necessity to take part well, in the marches? No. Or? I also, right. like, I needed to practice self-care that particular day. So, so I actually right. did not go to D.C. But I think that there's a much longer conversation about race and feminism mm -hmm. that needs to happen. It didn't happen during the election of Hillary Clinton. It didn't happen during the election of Barack Obama where we had sort of race versus sure. gender and some weird uh, dichotomous setup. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a long standing distrust um, and misunder multiple misunderstandings and hierarchical and patriarchal powers at play when it comes to black women and white women in this country. And those issues have never right. been dissected. So, the, and I, I, I know yet, many of those. And yet the, I, feel, I feel that what came out of that march was a connection. Uh, I think that that's what's spurring right. a lot of the protests now. It was yes. the first, you know, that. Well, I think it's also, it's a, it's a really great beginning point. Right. You know, and I think, you know, looking at the women who organize and sort of the diversity, intellectual diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, right. um, sexual orientation, diversity, whatever it may be, I think that's really important. And I think the protest politics, what's been most inspiring to me, is to see that all these different types of groups mm -hmm. are coming together, mm -hmm. right? So you're an environmentalist, that's your big issue. Gender is your big issue. Gender identity is your big issue. Racial you know, equality is your big issue. But we're all seeing that you know, we have to basically become the diversity super friends, like a, a group sure. that bands sure. together against some really strong forces where it's like they will not let this country go from their cold, dead hands. You know, if it's founded on white supremacy, patriarchy, and anti-black racism, it's not going to go away anytime soon. So it's our job, you know, to make sure that we fight, to make sure we don't roll back the strides of our parents' and grandparents' generations. So I, I love the intergenerational work. I mean, I think there are a lot of really fantastic things that came out of the march. The real question now is sustaining it. Mm -hmm. uh, what about Steve Bannon in the White House? 
because that, uh, you know, if you put, if you dress it up and you say alt-right, you know, that's one thing. But white supremacy, which is really what he trafficked in at Breitbart. Yeah, I wouldn't say trafficked. <laughs> I would say traffic, right? I mean, Traffics. he has a very specific right. vision of what this country should be and how it's lost its way. I mean, I refuse to say the word alt-right. It's a made-up mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. It's just a word to make sort of white people who are racist adjacent feel better about supporting a white supremacist. Right. I know the first time I used that on Facebook, I had a lot of people say, what, what, what is, is that? I mean, it's, it's just, it's made <laughs> up, right? Right, I mean, right. I, I'm trying to be polite, but why should we be polite? Why, why should we be polite? We're talking about a white supremacist, someone who believes that many groups of people are less than and should not be, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I don't understand for the people who voted for Donald Trump, and he's got Steve Bannon very prominent in all facets of his, his campaign. Security and now, now taking yeah. over from the generals. Right. And the thing is, Donald Trump told you that he was important to him. He told you that he would be important to him. And if you could ignore that, that mm -hmm. says more about you than it says about Donald Trump. Right? I mean, Steve Bannon is historically, he, there is without a shadow of a doubt, right? As, as I have been using this quote lately about from a... Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, you know, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. facts. Precisely. Steve Bannon as a white supremacist is a fact. That's mm -hmm. not my opinion. And That's and, not my feelings. And running the White House. And running the White House. He's, right. he's next door, right? right. Um, and so I think that that's a really powerful symbol for people who are possibly, well, I don't know, maybe Trump's not as bad when it comes to race. Like, he's just doing some things, but maybe it's about security and not necessarily about race and racism and ethnic cleansing. It's like, look next door. Right. Look to, you know, who the godfather is of all, of, of all these policies. Precisely. I could talk to you forever. I hope you will come back. You I know, will. You're, you're fantastic. <laughs> uh, I always finish by asking my guests to finish the statement, the power, the strength of black America lies in. How would you finish that? Us. Us. <laughs> the struggle in us. We have the tools. We have the toolbox. We just need to sort of find other folks in our group and outside of our group who believe in the same or similar mission and get to work. Okay, well, thank you so much, <laughs> thank Dr. You. Christina Greer. You're fantastic. Come back again. Anytime. And thanks to you all out there for watching and joining us as well. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. We'll see you the next time.